And so right here, oh, nope, I moved the pacing on one too far. There we go. Um, so on slide nine, I put a notes organizer. And so we are going to be going over a bunch of things. I've written down a ton of notes, and I'll show you where they are in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to give you a space where you could write some notes yourself. And uh, you can use the pencil tool. You can use the text tool so you can type stuff out here. And so please feel free to utilize this on slide nine uh, to take notes. And you'll have access to these notes after our session. Any other questions? Okay. So what we're going to do um, first is if everyone could move on to slide 10, I want to give you a chance to play around with this modified sketch pad. So this is a problem that I gave my students. And you can see they're being asked essentially to solve this equation. And they had a sketch pad here that they had to show their work on. And then they checked the boxes to explain the different steps they used. Okay. So if everyone could go on to slide 10 and just take a minute to play around with that. And look at the sketch pad. See what's a little different about it. So for example, I'm going to just start by writing this equation. And notice, normally a sketch pad would start with the pencil. But I set it up so that the first tool was actually the math type. And that's intentional because I want students to write in the math type, rewrite the equation nice and neat so I can actually read it. And the other thing I did is I changed the colors around. You'll notice I've put a yellow instead of the orange they have and I changed the order. And that's because I did color coding in my class and each color coordinates with one of the steps that we would use. So the, this example of a modified sketch pad, it's really helpful, I find, for um, when you're giving students equation problems or problems where uh, they need to use a variety of different colors to demonstrate their work. Um, it's really nice. And it, and it, <laughs> the other thing is students have a bit of fun with it, um, especially if you put some odd and interesting colors in there. One of my teammates at Hardin, um, after I showed her this coding, she, she went a little wild and put all these different colors in. And anytime I used one of her lessons, the students had so much fun on the sketch pad uh, drawing with the different colors. So what we're going to do now, and by the way, has everyone had a chance to look at slide 10? Everyone's had a chance to play around with it? Okay, thank you, Elizabeth and Ramon, Gloria, Guadalupe. Okay, awesome. So, awesome. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to look at the coding. We're going to look at the coding that I did to make that, um, to make it do what it did. <laughs> Uh, so right now, I am in the activity view. Has anyone not seen this before? Has anyone not been inside activity view? Like when you're built with the activity builder? Never. Okay. 
So what I would say is that if you've never been inside the activity builder, that was yesterday's session. So whenever they post yesterday's video, I did record it. I would highly recommend you go back and watch yesterday's video because there's more than I can explain uh, in five minutes. There, that's why I did a whole two hour session because uh, you know there's a, there's a lot to go over. So I won't be able to go over everything. But in the activity builder, you have different objects that you can use. So for example, you have a note tool. This right here is a note. And in here, I typed a few different things. First thing, please sign in. This right here is a button. Okay, that's a bit more complex coding. So we're not gonna touch on buttons today, uh, but you can see this is a button object. And I can go into preview here and preview and see this is what students will see. I've got another note, another note. I've got a text input box. I've got a check box. I've got another note. And you'll notice that some of them have these, uh, you know, these turquoise highlighted. Uh, I, I always think of them as alligators with a slash between them. That indicates that some coding has been done on that object. So for example, right here, you didn't get to see the other parts until you clicked, click here after you sign in. And then you saw the other parts. Was anyone wondering how I did that? <laughs> yeah, that, that can be really cool. I did it with magic. That's how I did it, Femi. I, I, I you know, use my, the Harry Potter wizard wand that my parents gave me when I was 11 or so, you know, Wingardium Leviosa that. No, <laughs> no. So <laughs> what I did was I used some basic coding. And I'm going to use this as an example to walk you through the language of code. Because coding is a different language. It is a different mindset. And I'll, and like I alluded to, I'll be showing you the dictionary um, for this code in a little bit at the end of the session. But right here, you'll notice that I've given this button object a name. The name I've given it is continue button. And you'll notice that I typed it a specific way, lowercase c, capital B, and no space. The reason is because you don't want to put a space in here. A space would really mess it up. Um, but you want to make it readable. So each new word, uh, you capitalize it. So this is the name of the object, this button. So this button, its code name is continue button. And right here, let's just look at this note. What is your name? In the coding layer, I use the code hidden or the command hidden. So this command will make that note, what is your name, hidden, unviewable, under the specific circumstances that I tell it to be hidden. And so let's look at the code and I'll zoom in a little. Oh, there we go. I'll zoom in a little so it's a bit easier to see. Can everyone see the coding okay on their screen? Can everyone see what I've got highlighted okay? Okay. When continue dot but or continue button dot press count is greater than zero, false. Otherwise, true. That's the code I put in. What does that mean? When, okay, well, that's explanatory, when, and then I put the name of the button, continue button. So that's saying when this button right here, then I put dot press count. The dot is important because the continue button has several different qualities. 
So just like how we have our height, we have our name, we have our hair color, eye color, all different features about us. Different objects have different features. But the one we care about is the number of times you have pressed the button. And the command uh, for, for the number of times that you've pressed the button is press count. So this says when the continue button, when the continue buttons, possessive, press count is greater than zero, false. That false means hidden is not true. It is visible when the press count is greater than zero. So does that part make sense? Does this line of coding make sense? What questions are there about this line of coding? Can everyone give me, let's do a plus, minus, yes, no in the chat. If everyone could just let me know, does that line of coding make sense? Because um, the stuff we're going to do later is a bit more complicated. So if it's not making sense now, I want to make sure that we're going over that. Thank you, Margarita. Leticia, Mark, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate that. And then this last part is the otherwise statement. And it says, otherwise, true. When you're doing conditional coding, and this is an example of conditional coding, you've got a when statement and an otherwise statement. The otherwise means um, in all other circumstances. And you must have it. So if I take this out, you're going to see an error pop up. And the error is... It says expected an otherwise token, but found none. If I don't have an otherwise, the code won't run. So I'm just going to type in O, and you'll see automatically the otherwise pops up. So I'm going to press enter to get it. And then I'm going to type false. And there we go. So that's how I did the coding for literally all of these. You can see right here the exact same coding exact same coding for all of these elements. And, oh, pfft, ha, I put false twice. I should probably change that. There we go. You'll see debugging is an important skill. There we go. So does that give you, uh, does that give you a good idea about how the coding language works, how you can break it down, how you can understand what you're actually inputting into the code, into the into the computational layer. Okay, awesome. Because what we're going to be moving on to, uh, the next one is not super complicated. It is long, but it's not complicated. But eventually, we're actually going to be doing some conditional coding today. Um, so I wanted to start off with that example. Let's move on now to the main event that I said we would get to eventually. I'm on slide 10. And you'll see right here, this sketch pad has the turquoise highlighted broken alligators. And if I click on it, you'll notice I've got a few different commands here. So let me zoom in again. So I've got the first command is initial color. Well, initial color, that just tells it what color do you want uh, students to start with? So normally on Desmos, the initial color is blue. That's the default. That doesn't really work for me because I use blue to represent the distributive property. And not every problem has the distributive property. So I would change the initial color to black because that's the neutral color that everyone would write the problem in, and then they would show their steps in the other colors. So by putting this initial color, that's the command, 
and then I would call upon the class of colors. Okay, so colors is the class of variables, and there are six preset colors that Desmos has. Black, blue, green, purple, red, and orange. I'm going to put a dot here to say which specific one of them, because they can't start with all of them. And you could literally scroll down, or you could type, and you could put black in there. You could put any color you want in there, and that color would now be the initial color. So can everyone let me know, does that make sense? What questions are there about how to use the initial color code? Okay, thank you, Leslie, Lisa. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie, Guadalupe. Awesome. Okay. I do appreciate, I, I hope it doesn't come across weird, but I do appreciate the feedback because I can't really see any of y'all and I don't have Go Guardian. So, uh, you know, it's my only way of checking in and making sure I'm, I'm being effective in my explanations. Um, so the next thing I wanted to change was the initial tool because normally in Desmos, the initial tool is the pencil. Okay, well, I don't really want students to start with the pencil because I first want them in the math type box, like I said, to retype this equation. So I'm going to go and use the command initial tool. And then I'm going to type in the class sketch tools. And there's a lot of different sketch tools. So I'm going to put that period again. And after that period, I'm going to type in the specific tool. So I could have students start with the pencil or the line tool, the eraser tool, the point tool, so they only can do a point, um, the math type tool, or the text tool. Those are all the different tools that I have available to students to use. I wanted the math, so I'm going to put math type. So does that make sense how to do the initial tool selection on a sketch pad? Awesome. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Any questions that I can go over? Is if if it's not making sense, please do let me know. Could you make the tools appear after they type the problem? Um, so, oh, do you mean, so just so I understand this correctly, Scott, you're saying at first they only have access to the math type and then the other tools? Okay. I have never done that. That's a question that I would have to look at the dictionary for. <laughs> um, I don't believe so, um, but I have done no Desmos <laughs> over the summer. I didn't even check my computer over the summer, and I know Desmos is always adding new code, so it might be possible, but remind me again at the end of the session, Scott, and we could look at that at the end. Does that sound okay? How do you know which functions? Initial, ah, that would be the dictionary. So I'll go ahead and I'll show you the dictionary. This is the computational layer documentation. And if you look at each component in here, so right here is a sketch pad. It tells you all the sinks and all the sources. I've not really been using the word sink um, I've been using the word command because I think that's a bit easier to understand, but the Desmos word for a command is a sync. Uh, so you are syncing a command in. So on the sketch pad, you have 23 different commands that you could use. Um, oh, and it looks like, Scott, you have this allow eraser. The question would be the conditional formatting. So I don't know. I, I still don't know. I think the coding isn't there yet for the conditional part, but it does look like you could have some sort of basic conditionals where they can't access certain tools, but I'll, I'll, I'll look at that later. Um, so you have all these different 
uh, all these different commands uh, or syncs that you can use. And I reference this all the time. Um, and they do a really good job. You can look at the examples and um, you can kind of copy some of their stuff. It's pretty cool what they've got. Uh, so does that answer your question, Mark? Awesome. So now the last one, and this is the most fun one, is the available colors. And it's a little weird because you have to use some specific formatting to get it to work. But this will essentially expand or limit or change what colors are available. So for example, I wanted to have the six colors that I use in the classroom um, for solving an equation. So what I did is I typed colors and when I type colors up here, uh, you'll see there's another command or another part of it uh, called list. That list is the list of colors. Oh, thank you, Mark. I've got the link linked in the Desmos activity. That's why I forgot to do it, but thank you. Um, so this list here, we are editing the different colors in there. And again, you're going to have to type colors.black because you're referencing the specific black that's in Desmos, color.blue. But if you want to use a color outside of Desmos, then you can type RGB and put in three numbers. You can either do three numbers randomly or you could just Google uh, color picker. And this will pop up and then you could copy the RGB code. So right now you can see this like sage green that popped up. I'm going to go in here, change this to the three numbers for the sage green. And now that sage green is the six number to pop up. And so I could, you know, type in that sage green. So whatever colors you want, you can get them in there. What questions are there? Okay. So I've been talking for too long now. <laughs> so I've given you access to slide 11 now. And if you click right here on slide 11, you're going to see there's a template that I've made. And what you're going to do, for you, you're not going to have these same options because it's not yours. But what you're going to do is you're going to click on Copy and Edit. And then you're going to have, on slide one, uh, a sketch pad with nothing on it. And if you go into the computational layer, you'll see that I've written a bunch of essentially non-code. These hashtags mean they tell the computer, ignore this. This is editorial. And so what I've done is I've put instructions on how to change the initial tool. I've put instructions on how to change the initial color. And I've put instructions on how to modify the color palette. So I'm going to say, let's take until 1055. So take until 1055, but I want you to play around with the modified sketch pad. And then please feel free to ask me any questions that you have at any point. Um, so if everyone could go ahead and I'll stop presenting my screen for now. Um, but if everyone could go ahead to slide 11 and just try playing around with that coding and let me know if you have any questions. Um, and at the end, and please feel free if anyone wants to share their screen, I can help you with the coding or if you just want to show off, but take, take a few minutes to play around with this. Um, can you remind us how we access the coding? Absolutely. So I will uh, present my screen. So are you right here? Um, are you inside this part right here? 
inside the template? I had clicked into the modify the sketch pad screen, but I, I just I just see student screen preview. Like that's what it says on the top. Ah, okay. So what you're gonna do is this where you are right now? Yes. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to go right up here to the three dots. Okay. And I've got these three options that you won't have. Um, or I, no, these you only have these two, the share the activity and copy the activity. You're going to okay. click on copy and edit. Ah, okay, I see that now. And that will allow you to make a copy that you can edit. And then on that first slide, you're going to click on the alligator mouths that are separated by a wood log. <laughs> um, okay. And that's where the instructions are. Yeah, great question. Thank um, you. Of course. I have no clue, Mark, but I know I when I saw that RBG, I, was, uh, I, I always try to type in RBG instead of RGB. Oh, that'd be funny. That'd be that'd be Ruth Bader Ginsburg's. I'm 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 curious. Let's see. Huh. Okay. New York governor lit the state blue for justice. So I think that's probably the best answer I can give you. <laughs> um. But yeah. I, I'll do that in class. They'll ask me a question. I'm like, I don't know. Let's Google it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, and actually, in the meantime, while y'all are working, I'll give. Uh, let's take a few more minutes to work on uh, to play around with this. Um, Scott, I'm going to look in the dictionary to see if what you're asking is possible. No, not, I don't see a way given, so Scott, I don't see a way given the current commands um, and more specifically the current sources um, to do what I think you wanna do. Um, Yeah, I don't I don't think that's possible. But that is something where Scott, if you were to let Desmos know, um, they're pretty responsive to the community. So if you reach out to them, uh, maybe others have reached out as well. Uh, they've changed a lot this year because of community requests. Anyone need any support? It's so funny. You, I'm so used to having Go Guardian up. So when I release students, I can look over here. I'm like, I, I hope I'm not just twiddling my thumbs while everyone's waiting for me. Um, but yeah, let me know if you need any support on that slide one. I have a question for you. Oh yeah, go for it. Is Desmos pretty sensitive in terms of the spacing? So for example, if we are typing colors.list and then there's an open parentheses, does the parentheses have to go right after the T without a space between it? So um, I would not put a space between them. It, I don't, I'm curious. Let me try. Yeah, it will error if you put a if you put a space there. Um, so yeah, because if you don't if you put a space there, then it doesn't realize. Compu computers are pretty dumb. <laughs> it doesn't realize 
that that whole list of colors you've got next to it um, are modifying the list if you put a space there. So yeah, um, yeah, simple answer, spacing does matter and formatting does matter. So about one more minute, let me just check in. Is that enough time? Would people want a few more minutes to play around with this? Just let me know. Can you let me know in the chat uh, how many more minutes you feel like you need to play around with the modifying the sketch pad? Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, does two minutes sound okay for everyone else? Is everyone, would that be okay? Okay. So two more minutes. Are y'all trying to put in different colors? See what, just, are, I, I've sometimes put in random numbers into the uh, RGB just to see what color it is. That's always pretty fun. And just so you know, you can put more than six colors or fewer than six colors. Uh, I once made a palette that had probably 25 different colors on it. So yeah, you can really get wild with it. Okay, so is it okay if we move now or move on now to the next topic? Because I want to make sure we have plenty of time to finish everything, especially the sentence frames. Is it okay if we move on to the follow-up question now? Okay, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Tiana. Mark, thank you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So any questions, first of all, before before we move on, any questions, anything you want me to debug? That's another thing. If you're getting an error, it's please feel free to just share your screen and we can go over it. Did it all work for everyone? Hopefully, hopefully it was able to make, hopefully you're able to get some cool colors on there. Okay. So let me go ahead and present my screen again. And if everyone could go on to slide 12 of the Desmos activity I gave you, um, I want you to try putting a few different answers in there. So I've given you the question or the, the, the question, simplify the expression square root of 14 squared. Now I want you to go in and, uh, math teachers, I know this will be hard. Put the wrong answer in there, put the right answer in there. Just see what happens as you put different answers in there. Uh, okay, no worries, April. Um, so just so you know, the, the template I made has all the instructions. Um, so even if you're not able to follow along during the, uh, the independent portion, uh, you'll still get all the same information and guides. Um, so, and, and also please feel free to email me throughout the year if you have any questions about Desmos, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along 
um, even if you can't do the work on your phone. Sorry about that. So here, I put in a 14. And the follow-up question I got is, explain why the square root of 14 squared is 14. But I could also, let's change this to 20. Explain why the square root of 14 squared is 20. And I could do a 200. And, and I think you're starting to see whatever answer I put in here, the follow-up question is modifying uh, itself, differentiating to whatever my answer is. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> because you're not just putting some vague thing right here, you know, explain why you think this is the answer to the problem, because that's pretty vague, and there's a lot of vague words in there, and especially for English learners or academically disabled students, all those words can, you know, be a bit confusing, and it can be a little like word salad, but now I'm asking the very specific question, explain why the square root of 14 squared is... 200 because that's what they think, you know, that, that the square root of 14 squared would be. I'll put 14 in there. There we go. That was making me itch. <laughs> Does this seem like something you'd want to be able to do in your class in Desmos activities? Does this seem like something that you would like to be able to input like a high leverage strategy? Yeah. And this is where we get into some pretty cool coding. So I'm going to go uh, right in here. And so I'm looking at the teacher view of this problem. So simplify the expression square root of 14 squared. And right here, I've got ask student to explain their answer. And normally when you have that check, it'll just say, explain your reasoning. I'm going to click on the alligators and I'm going to use the command or the sync explain prompt. And then I've got the colon. I'm going to put a space here. Uh, you do want to put a space here to separate the two. In quotes, I'm going to put whatever I want my follow-up question to be. And that part is relatively simple. Okay, so I'm going to take this out for now. I could put in here, explain why the square root of 14 or of, uh, 14 squared. Uh, by the way, these little backwards apostrophes, if you click the tilde button under escape, <coughs> you'll get those backwards apostrophes. That's what you use to get math type. So this is all written in math type. Uh, or actually not that so much, but this part right here, the 14 squared, that's written in math type. The way you get it written in math type is by using these backwards apostrophes. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of this for now. And I could just say is um, explain, and I'm going to change this to explain what the square root of 14 squared is is okay and if i do that now i've just got a static question they're all going to get that same question to make it dynamic i'm going to be referencing my own uh, the object in itself i want to reference the uh, the answer that students input into the object. So to do that, we're going to have to use a referential. And inside of quotes, to do that, we are going to click on the dollar sign and the bracket and then an end bracket. And I wish I could tell you why they chose this. But that's the format you use to type code into a quote. 
So this is code, but the students won't see it as code. They're going to see it as whatever that code, code for, codes for. So in this case, I am referencing this object. So this, and ignore the error right now, it's erroring because it's not a complete object. This references this specific object. Instead of this, what I could do is I could name this object and I could say answer. Well now, in here I would type answer and that's telling it even more specifically what object. Okay, so you have both those options this only works if you are referencing this specific object. And specifically, we are referencing the latex. The latex is whatever is typed into the math type box. Whatever the student inputs, that's called the latex. And now, when I go to preview, and I put that 14 in there, now the student doesn't see the dollar sign bracket answer or this dot latex. The student sees whatever is put into the latex itself, 14. So does that code make sense? Awesome, thank you, Mark, Lisa. Okay, thank you, Claudia. What questions are there? What questions are there about this coding? Okay. So I'm not seeing any questions. So now we're going to combine what we did at the very beginning with what we're doing right now. We are going to do some conditional coding. I, I, let me try. I, I could try and convince you I'm not the spy for the dolphin lord. But <laughs> you'll notice when you click on this yes, it gives you one question. Okay. If you click on I didn't think so it gives you another follow-up question. And when you click on no, it gives you a, a, a third follow-up question. And that's really, really useful. I use that all the time in my Desmos activities. Um, and so the way to do that is not too hard. I'm gonna zoom out. Can, can you read the code okay if I zoom out so it's all on one line? Or should I zoom in? Is this readable as is? It's okay. I'll zoom in just so you know. The well here should be on this line, but when I zoom in, it, it goes to a new line. Um, there we go. Is that a bit better? Awesome. Okay. Just know that this who cannot swim well, that should be. Uh, okay. No worries, Tessa. Thanks for coming when you could. So um, what we're going to be doing is we are going to use the explain prompt. And now we're going to use a bunch of win statements. When this, because I'm referencing this specific object, is selected, and that tells that uh, that's the reference for what uh, choice is selected. Okay, so if you look here, you see a yes, and I don't think so, and a no. The computer reads this as choice one, choice two, and choice three. So when this object has choice one selected as the answer, the prompt will be, what do you think gives away their aquatic nature? Please explain. When this is selected, okay, yeah, there, 
no worries, Elizabeth. For some reason, they messed up. I, I hope everyone was able to read my email. This is a two-hour session, but they messed up and and listed it as from 10 to 11. So if anyone needs to leave, please feel free to. I won't be offended. Um, this will be video recorded, but yeah, it it, it is a two-hour session. Um, so sorry about that. So when this is selected to, thank you, Gloria. Thanks for coming. So when this is selected, option number two, they're asked, why are you so suspicious? <laughs> and then we have to put an otherwise in here because if we don't put an otherwise, then this command, the computer will read it as if there's no last case scenario. Bye, Vanessa. Sorry about that. Have a great class. So we need to put that otherwise. Without the otherwise, this is unreadable to the computer. Okay? So any questions about this coding? Any questions about how to do it? Okay. So in that case, oh, it makes sense. Awesome. In that case, go ahead and on slide two and slide three, um, go ahead and type in some sentence frames. So you'll see, or excuse me, some follow-up questions. So by Femi. So go ahead and uh, the first one on slide two, you're going to be using the, the dollar sign and the brackets. On slide three, you can use some of the conditionals. So the instructions are there for all of them. So let's take until how about 1118, or actually let's do 1120. That give us nine minutes. I think that should be a good amount of time. So let's take until uh, nine or uh, 1120. And if there's any errors, if anything that needs to be dug, be, be debugged, please let me know. Uh, please feel free to share, share your screen. Uh, but again, you're going to go to the, the Desmos tempi, template copy that you made. And on slide two and slide three, go ahead and make those uh, follow-up questions. Um, I have another question. Yeah, go for it. So my question to you is, you know, a little bit off topic from the actual coding. That's how right. long, how often do you have students do Desmos lessons, number one, and number two, how long does it typically take you to create a Desmo lesson like this? Um, great question. So I had them do it every day last semester, even the first day. <laughs> wow. Um, every day was a Desmos. Every assessment was a Desmos. Every homework was a Desmos. Okay. Um, that was the one platform I used. They got super proficient at it. Um, and I didn't use anything else. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. The, how long it takes. It, when you get started with activities, it takes you a while. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then after about a week to two weeks, you'll notice it takes you much less time. And by the end, I could whip out a, a very a very good lesson with some basic coding in 30 minutes, you know, 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. All right. And yeah. So it's not terribly long. Um, the other thing is that if you get other people in your PLC, what we would do at my PLC, because we had three people using Desmos, um, we would take turns making a lesson and then we would just copy and edit the, uh, you know, whoever's lesson it was um, for that day. And so that way we weren't all having to make a lesson together. So by, by like March, I would say I was spending maybe an hour and a half a week to two hours max making lessons. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, of course.
So just a quick check-in. How's everyone doing? Any questions? Any bugs popping up? Please let me know if there's anything I can help with. I have another question. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Sorry, I have a little question. Don't, um, please don't apologize. I love questions. So do you use Desmos for assessment purposes? And if so, does it automatically grade for you? No, it doesn't. Well, yes, yes, I use Desmos for assessments. No, it does not automatically grade. Um, the Desmos team is very principled. Um, and for better or worse. And I think this year, I think I might've appreciated had they budged on it, uh, but they don't have any plans to put an auto grading feature in. That being said, if you stick around at the end, I can show you what I did and, and a bunch of other people did too. It wasn't an auto grade feature, but it made grading very quick and easy. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to do a, ch oh, let's see. Can student responses be exported into a spreadsheet? Uh, no. So Desmos can't be exported into a spreadsheet. But um, one thing that uh, I don't know if you got it, if, if you'll have a chance to watch uh, my video from yesterday, my yesterday session, um, I, I kind of show how Desmos activities stick around in perpetuity. And I can actually, uh, have you used Desmos in the class before, Leticia, with your students? No, this is my first time. Okay. So I'll go ahead and present my screen. And um, so, so for example, I could look at this assessment from linear for linear equations that I gave them in March. <clears throat> and you can see I have their responses here and they'll stick around in perpetuity essentially. Um, so I could go back here and analyze each individual student's responses uh, or I could analyze um, all the students' responses as a whole. Um, so no, it doesn't export, um, but you still have very easy access to all the students' information. Does that help answer your question and show you what you can do? Yeah, I was just wondering, because what made me think of that is asking the question about grading and if you could get the responses to a spreadsheet and then it'd be just, you know, using formulas to grade it, but okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, no, they, it doesn't yet upload into a spreadsheet. That is something I think they're working on. I, I personally think that'd be really awesome. Um, but at this point, no. Um, but yeah, if you want to stick around also, Leticia, at the end, I can show you the, the workaround um, that we figured out at HMS that worked pretty well. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So I just want to check in. The, how's everyone doing? Are we ready to move on to the sentence frames? Would you like a few extra minutes? 
Let me know if you're ready to move on in the chat or how many min more minutes you would want um, for the follow-up questions. Three more minutes, okay. So we probably won't have time for independent practice like I had hoped, um, but I think this is useful time right now. So as long as you, everyone's okay with that, I'm okay with that. Just get, okay. So how about, how about until 11.25, would that be okay? Uh, because I do want us to move on to the sentence frames uh, because I think that's going to be the most effective strategy. So just a quick check-in, how's everyone doing? Any questions I can field? Any bugs I can help figure out? Um, so, uh, just a quick question about the site next sign in. Uh, so Scott, you Scott, just to clarify, you signed in on the Google form at eleven or at ten eleven. You're saying, I don't know how they're doing it. Um, <laughs> uh, that's not something that we handle as presenters. That's something that uh, that Jen Rogers and Brianna Gann uh, handle. So. I can I can send them a note just being like, hey, Scott was here at 10 exactly instead of 1011. I have no clue if that'll make a difference or not. I'm sorry I can't be more helpful. Yeah, of course. Yeah, here I'll do that right now. Yes, they updated that this morning, Lisa, <laughs> like literally right before the session. I've had, <laughs> I don't know if like who's conspiring against me, but it seems like there's always an issue with sketch with each one of my sessions. So 
hope we'll see what what tomorrow brings <laughs> um I think they only are deleting people signing in before 10 a.m., not after 10 a.m. You can sign in late, they had said yesterday. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, well, I just sent it, I just sent that question, Scott. So, uh, and I see Jen Rogers um, responding right now. Um, so I will let you know, but in the meantime, is it okay with everyone if I move on? Oh, and yes, Scott, you're fine. You get the whole two hours. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead, present my screen, and so sentence frames are the most high leverage strategy that we're gonna learn today. And they're the best way to get students writing. And it was so funny because my, my partner teaches high school, uh, a, a much smaller high school. Her high school is smaller than Hardin. <laughs> um, and she, she was talking with an English teacher who was complaining about how he couldn't get his kids to write and none of them could. And she pulled up one of her Desmos activities and I taught her how to code actually, which was funny because she's a computer, she has a computer science background um, and I don't. And she showed them uh, all the great sentences that her students were writing and the English team was a little pissed. <laughs> Um, but that's how much of a difference these sentence frame make or these sentence frames make. They, they really do get the students writing and the writing generally speaking is higher quality than what they would write without the sentence frames, which I think we all know in general. Uh, but it was just really cool to see it collected. The evidence was so clear in a digital format and the code is relatively simple and similar uh, to how you would write or how you would make a sentence or how you would make a follow-up question. So right here, what's your favorite kind of ice cream and why? Well, if I click on the text box here and I go to the alligators, the code, the command this time is initial text. And I'm just going to do a very simple initial text and in parentheses, I'm going to write the question. Okay. Or the, not the question, excuse me, the sentence frame. And so you could change this around. Um, so I tended to do this format. Um, one of the other teachers at Hardin, she preferred to put blanks right there. Um, and that was her, that was her style. So she would go in and edit and put the blanks in there. Cause you know, she liked that, um, because blank. Um, and then there was another teacher who, excuse me, didn't like putting compound sentence frames in there. So she would always do my favorite kind of ice cream is blank. I like this because, and you go to preview and you can see that's what students see right there. Those are the sentence frames that they have. And the coding is really, really simple. It's just initial text. And then in quotes, you write whatever it is you want them to see as the sentence frame. Any questions about this? I just have a real quick question, um, yep. and, I, and I, this has may already been answered. Or um, students who don't choose to use that, mm -hmm. it, um, they can can they delete that initial text, or do they just type below it, or what's what what happens? That's a great question because, and I told the students this: they didn't have to use the sentence frames. So in that case, if they didn't want to use the sentence frames, uh, usually what they would do is they would delete it. 
Uh, occasionally, some of them would just write their own sentence here, I, you know, and 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 whatnot. But uh, but more often than not, they would just delete it, and you absolutely can. So it doesn't mean that it's fixed or static. Uh, you can they can edit it around to make it appropriate to them. So, like for example, maybe a student's lactose intolerant, they could change ice cream to sorbet. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Anything that I can help clarify? Is there a way to differentiate the sentence frames or the options for sentence frames for students? You just type them all in in the same box or? You just read my mind. <laughs> um, because we're about to get into conditional sentence frames. Um, but before I do that, do you, or do you mean like giving them a question what is your favorite kind of ice cream and why? And then they would choose the sentence frame and that sentence frame would pop up in here. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, because we have different levels of English learners in our classes. And so we want to differentiate the, the level. Of Absolutely. Use. You know, I was going to go... I was going to go with a different example. I was going to go back to this one and show y'all how to add the sentence frames, but I, I prefer your example. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with that and show you how to do that. So what you're going to do is you're going to choose a multiple choice object. So I click on multiple choice. It pops up um, and I'm just going to drag it up here. You could also drag it from here, but Oh, now I've got it. I need to delete it. I don't need two multiple choice objects. And in each multiple choice object, you're going to type in the sentence frame that you would want to give to students. So um, my favorite kind of ice cream is dot, 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 because dot, dot, dot. Okay. So that, that could be one. Or you could do, I love to eat dot, uh, dot, 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 because dot, dot, dot. And whatever the options are, I'm just spitballing here, but um, dot, dot, dot is my favorite ice cream, ice cream because dot, dot, dot. Okay, let's say that we're going to go with those three options, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this object a name because what I want to do is I want to reference in this text input object the choice they made here. And to reference this, I need to name it. It makes no difference what you name it. My partner will put some pretty funny names in there. Students won't see them. So... <laughs> Um, you can be as weird or wacky as you want um, with them. I like to I like to put logical ones. Um, so I'll put ice cream sentence frame because that's what this is. That's the name of this object now. So when I go in here to code, I'm going to start with the same command or sync initial text. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to put a conditional when. So when, and now I'm going to put the name of the object, the ice cream sentence frame. So that's that object is this multiple choice right here. Dot, because it has a lot of properties and I want to select which one. And the property I care about is which choice is selected. So I'm going to type in here when the sentence frame that is selected is the first one. That's what this basically means in English. When they select the first sentence frame, in quotes, in quotes right here, the sentence frame is going to be, um, and actually, we're going to, did it backwards. We're going to do ice cream dot sentence frame, and we are going to do choice content one. What does that mean? 
choice content means whatever is written right here as the content for the first multiple choice answer. So does that make sense, the coding, the coding I've done so far, Margarita? Awesome. And then we would do, we would basically just copy, I mean, you could literally copy this um, and paste it down here and just replace when the second option is selected, we want the second answer as the sentence frame. And so you'll notice I've got these quotes here, okay? Um, because if I don't put quotes, it doesn't, it doesn't output it as a string. So you need to have those quotes. And then the final thing is you need an otherwise statement. And for this otherwise, I'm just gonna simply put in quotes, uh, the otherwise you don't need this conditional. As a matter of fact, if you put this, put something like this in with the otherwise statement, it won't understand it. So I'm just gonna do otherwise, ice cream sentence frame dot choice content three. And now, um, oh, you know what? I just realized there's something else I need to do for this one. We're getting into some more complex coding. Um, I'm actually not going to make this the otherwise statement because if I make it the otherwise, and they haven't selected any, then that's the default response. So I'm actually going to do an otherwise with a blank sentence frame. So this right here, these empty or these quotes with nothing in between, that just tells it put blank, put a blank there. And so now, right now, we haven't chosen a sentence frame, so it's blank. But if I choose the first one, now it'll tell them or give them the option, my favorite kind of ice cream is blank because blank. I love to eat blank because, or blank is my favorite ice cream because. So does that, uh, can a slide reference or not? Yes. Um, yes, it can. Um, and you get into some complicated stuff if you have objects of the same name on different slides. Um, but yes, you can do that. So let's say I go to a different slide here and I'm just gonna, to make it simple, I'm just gonna copy this um, as a text input box just to show you. Um, right here, I'm gonna choose my favorite kind of ice cream is. Well, right here on the next slide, it pops up as my favorite kind of ice cream is. Um, so yeah. What we did is a little bit more complicated than what I had intended to show. And that's absolutely fine because I think this is a lot more relevant. Um, is anyone feeling a little confused? Oh, the share with class. I, yes, so you can have students Uh, and I always uncheck that, um, but yeah. Can you, so no, you can't approve their responses. That's, and that's part of the reason I never, I rarely check it. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't usually do that. Um, yeah, I would agree with you, Latice. Yeah, this is amazing. I mean, I, like seriously, when I, when I learned how to do this, I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, I honestly, I felt somewhat like a real teacher last semester. Uh, and that was a nice feeling. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, how's everyone feeling about this example and this explanation? Any questions, anything that's confusing, not making sense? I'm glad you're feeling good, awesome. Okay, so how about this? Let's see, let's see. 
let me reference the agenda, which kind of tore up, but that is absolutely okay. So we have 25 minutes until I had wanted to show the computational layer, but honestly, uh, I kind of shared that already and Mark put that into the chat, which I was really grateful for. Are you feeling overwhelmed, Ramon? It, what can I do to help you feel less overwhelmed? And while, while Ramon's responding, please feel free. There, there are, but here's what I would say. What I've done is I've put in here, uh, not there, I put in here uh, all the information you need. Okay, so you've got step-by-step -step guide how to do everything that we've done today. Um, so did you, were you able to uh, open, were you able to get uh, this activity open, Ramon? The template, yeah. So it has all the instructions in there. You're right, this is a lot. <laughs> Um, usually when I, when I taught my coworkers, we would do like 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there. So it is a lot to have, you know, just this for two hours, especially if you never coded before, please feel free to reach out to me throughout the year. I'm, I'm, I love Desmos and I'm so happy to help. I'm <laughs> yeah, the recording should help as well, Stephanie. Um, so anyways, please take the next 24 minutes uh and take a bathroom break if you need to um but play around with the sentence frames and the other thing i wanted to show you is there's an extension activity um right here with math input boxes okay um so you'll learn how to do some cool stuff uh with late with latices um if you do this extension i can help with it but i also put uh, the instructions right here, what to do. Okay. So play around, add some sentence frames, the slides two and three, and yeah, see what, uh, see what you can do and let me know what I can do to support. Erica Lynn, this is Lori. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit lost too. I didn't realize that I was. So <laughs> thank, thank you for Ramon for making me double check to see if I was lost. When you showed that last slide, because I was going to ask you if there was like a cliff notes or a cheat sheet of all this, and you showed that last slide, the co I made a copy of the Desmos activity, but it only has four slides on it. Yeah, that's what I have. Where did yeah. you find all the, oh, okay, yeah, where are the cheat sheets? So right here, if you, um, if you go to any slide, so I'm on the first slide, and uh -huh. you're going to see the teal turquoise alligators. If you click on that, that's the computational layer script, and that's where you get all the information, all the notes. So for each slide, I would check, I would, um, oh, let me, did I make a copy? Okay. All right, I'll play around with that and see if I have more questions. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And if anyone wants to at any point share their screen, um, especially for debugging, Debugging is a really good skill to have. Um, I did a session on Desmos earlier, um, I think in May, and somebody had a persistent bug, and so we fixed it. And that was that was pretty helpful to understand how to analyze code to debug it. Um, so yeah, please take some time. I'll be here, and just let me know if you need any support or any way that, if there's any way I can help. Just a quick question. Yeah. Those, um, that that other slide that you showed where you actually click into the little alligators and it tells you the, the directions, is that something that you yourself typed in or is it something that can be found throughout Desmos whenever we need to like create a certain type of object or? It's something that I typed in um, and I typed it in to make it a bit more user novice friendly. Right, right. The, and I'll actually put the link again in the chat. And I, um, the link is available um, on slide 17. Um, this is the computational layer documentation. And 
this is where Desmo, this is the dictionary essentially. Okay. So if you go to components, you can look at all the different objects that you could have. Um, so for example, math input, you can see there's 19 different sinks. A sink is a command and there's nine different sources. So a source is the quality of that object that we are referencing elsewhere. So for example, when we did the sentence frames, we sourced the content of each multiple choice answer as a sentence frame into the text box. Um, this is where you can find every single command definitively, a description of what the command does, an example of the command, and if you click right here, you can try it out as a Desmos activity and play around with it and really see. So for example, I'm going to put the wrong answer in here. Um, what? Where? Oh, Desmos made a mistake. <laughs> what are they doing? Oh, you have to type a valid answer. Oh, that's where the error comes in. Ah, okay. That's the, okay. Anyways, but yeah, it'll show you uh, how to use that code. Okay. Um, I use this all the time, all the time. And they're constantly updating. it. So yeah, that's where I would check if you're trying to figure out what each code does. Uh, what is the cause or where does, ah, that's a great question, Lori. So here I'll present my screen again. Actually, Lori, would you mind presenting your screen? If you would here, prefer. Let me check my tabs to make sure I don't have something embarrassing open. I'm thinking, <laughs> here we go. Like I've had a thousand of your Desmo activity tabs, but all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a malfunction once and, uh, I, I'm a game, I'm a, I do a lot of computer video games and it was so funny because it showed all the video games that I play <laughs> and the students, the students had a fun time asking me about all of the games. That's funny. Yeah. Um, now, here we go, tabs. Now I'm like, uh, slightly changed since I've used this last. Here's a Desmos activity and I'm wanting to see if I've made, a, if this is the one I made a copy. Oh, let's see what I've got here. Okay, so I have that. And then I have this one, mm. and then I have this one, which is what I really want. I don't know where I got the other ones. You want to God's honest truth? Okay. Clicking stuff. So this is the one that I think I've made a copy of. Yeah, yep. this is my copy. Where is it? I don't recall logging into to Desmos. I do have an account. I think everyone does in the in the district, but I I got on it a couple times. Is that where this is? Did it just know to open that up, or where the heck is it? So when you make a copy, it'll automatically open up. Uh -huh. but you, can you go back to the teacher.desmos.com just home screen? Uh, teacher, let's see if I have that one open still. I think it was the screen you just showed us. This one? Yeah. Yes. So if you click on custom activities, that's where it takes you to a list of all activities that you either made or that you copied. Okay. Because when you copy it, it becomes you, it becomes yours. So you'll see it, it says copy of 7 slash 20 Desmos template by Eric Lynn, and then it says edited by you. So that tells you that is your version of the template I made. Got it. Thanks. I don't recall opening that up, so it just automatically was able to tell because I'm in the same Google Drive. Uh huh. Well, and isn't did, Google smart? I mean, isn't Desmo smart? <laughs> yeah. And I, I have a question. Did your co-teacher um, add you as a co-teacher on the Desmos activities? Um. 
No, I don't think so. Um, I think he thought he did because I would say, Hey, I can't, I can't see the dad. I, I don't know where my kids are. And, you know, um, it was a stressful year last year. Yes. Uh, and, and Oh yeah. <laughs> um, my co-teacher didn't really even want to be a co-teacher. So we were very kind to each other and had a, a, a um, uneventful year, which was good from our, mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really press him on that. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I know, he said he did, but I never saw it. <laughs> I could never get into it. And I just gave up. Do you want me to show you how you can add somebody? Uh-huh, sure. Okay. Is it okay if I share my screen now? Please. Okay. So um, can you back out of the presenting so I can oh, share? Yep. I wasn't okay. sure if we could now just um, boot people out or not. I wasn't sure. Oh, no worries. Okay. Uh, or maybe it does. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's been so long since I've been using this. Um, okay. So um, when I go to my classes, uh, you'll see right here, I had a lot of co-teachers um, in part because at Hardin they asked that um, we add the principal and VP as co-teachers to all our classes. So they showed up as the co-teachers. Um, but also um, I had some instructional aides. I had my co-teacher. Um, we had the school psych who would come and observe sometimes. So I had a lot of co-teachers. Um, that's the easiest way. Um, once you do this, though, that's not enough. <laughs> um, that's not quite enough because what you're going to do when you go to your activities. So let's, I'm going to go just to this one. Um, I, and I changed this recently. I'm going to go to manage editor editors. So right here, the three dots, I'm going to click on manage editors and you can add somebody. So, um, for example, I would add Teresa Rainey. Um, and so I would just type her email in and it would add her. And so that is something that I would do before every lesson. And, um, Usually, hopefully, hopefully well before every lesson. So she'd have a chance to view it beforehand. And once you did, once I did that, it would actually pop up here as one of her custom activities. And so that's, that's how I was able to know that uh, you, you're, you may not have been added as a co-teacher because if you're a co-teacher, they all pop up under custom activities. I figured that was your clue. But my question is why? What's the, well, I will tell you, I, when he said he added me, I was never able to pull up their answers. I was never able to follow along. There were a couple of times he was absent. And when he's absent or when I, anytime my co-teacher is absent, I take on the primary leader mm -hmm. role or usually, mm -hmm. but I couldn't access these. So I couldn't like see who was doing what or other than just uh, go guardian. So yeah. what's the difference between what you did as far as just adding a co-teacher and then giving the editing rights? Why, why is one better than the other or what? What makes it doable? Difference is night and day. Um, because if you're not added as a co-teacher and you're not the person who made the activity or who assigned the activity, then you have no power. You can't go in and view student responses. Um, but for example, um, and actually it, we something happened and I had to switch co-teachers towards the end of the year. Uh, so I had a different co-teacher. Uh, oh, and fourth period, that wasn't uh, his class or our class. Um, why is it only showing fourth period? Why? Some, I don't know why. My, something weird happened with my Desmos. It got rid of my sixth period somehow, and I need to fix that. Um, Oh, this is weird. Anyways, um, when I go in to view here the dashboard, um, I can give feedback to students. As a co-teacher, you can do that too. So I could look here and I could say, you know, to this student, um, great start. Make sure to finish 
writing the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. And as a code teacher, you have that ability not just to track all of students' work, but you have the ability to give feedback as well. And so that was really awesome because um, I could, because we could both be monitoring and scanning at the same time. And so my code teacher knew who to talk to and who to work with without me necessarily having to tell them because they had the same access I did. So they saw all the same answers. They saw all students work right here um, and they could respond, be responsive to students' needs. So I would definitely encourage if it's a co-taught lesson um, to, to, to have both of you as the teachers. Um, so whoever's the one who assigns it would need to go in and add the other one as a co-teacher. And to do that, you would just go, to do that, you would just go uh, to manage editors. Yeah, of course. I think I just realized why my period six isn't showing up. Let me test my theory. Any other questions? I want to just check in with how everyone's doing. Is this Desmos you presented from public? Can you clarify, Lisa? If I wanted to go in and open up your actual presentation as a teacher instead of a student, is it public on Desmos? Uh, yes, all of mine are public. Um, and yeah, so if you were to you would have to copy and edit all of them. Um, but yeah, you could theoretically Google search <laughs> and find all of my Desmos activities. Um, and I'm and I'm in the process of making collections of them. Um, so I can just send, I, I can make it easier for you and just send, it, send you the collection. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions, any errors or bugs that need to be fixed? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have one collection already. Um, yeah, of course. I only have the collection on transformations. So I'll put that one in the chat because that's that's a collection that I have ready. Every lesson in there, I'm like, yep, that's that's okay. That's that's good. Um, had some did some fun stuff with it, uh, with transformations in particular. Um, this right here was all coding. Um, and actually, I'll show you. Um, let me go to this one. So you can see students would have the ability to check their answers. Um, and we're going to be going over that, um, over that ability uh, tomorrow. So tomorrow I'll be teaching a, a, a class on self-assessments, uh, same time from 10 to 1215. Um, so if you're interested in learning about self-assessments, um, we'll be doing that tomorrow. I will say that is heavy duty coding. That is, that is a, a lot more intensive on the coding part. Um, but it's also so awesome. It made my life so much easier once I got all these figured out. Um, once I got the, the self-assessments down. Um, but yeah, I put in the link, um, my transformations collections or collection. And as I get other collections built, I can distribute those as well to anyone who wants. I'll take a list. So, okay. So Stephanie. 
Would it be helpful if we emailed you that request? Do that so you have our email right there for you? Um, I am taking your names down now and I can get your emails pretty quickly. Um, so if you want to, please, please go for it. Uh, that, I mean, that wouldn't hurt to email me, but I've, I've got your info down, Lori, so I can find. Okay. Well, I, because I, because I have to email a lot of teachers cause I'm a sped teacher. There are ah. some teachers that have, like, there's a couple of Sarah Floreses. There's a couple of, was it, uh, you know, so yeah <laughs> there's more than one of us but anyway that's awesome i will just leave it at that because you are clearly on top of it <laughs> uh i i mean i think i have a benefit of being young <laughs> and and tech when it comes to tech um and it it's not as daunting for me just because i grew up with it you're a digital native walk up dog yeah as I'm not, I am like, I, the, the horse and buggy, when that newfangled electric thing, or, you know, when the cars came in, I always figured that's what it must have been like for those poor guys who uh, had only done horses. So I'm, I'm yeah. like that. <laughs> well, and it's funny because my, my cousins are, um, I've got the cousins I'm really close to, um, one of them is eight years younger than me. One of them is 11, which really is not that much younger, but they, the fluency they have with technology, it's just incredible. Like they really grew up with it. Like I kind of grew up with it, but like they're really growing up with it. And honestly, I'm sure in five, 10 years, it's going to be to the point where you know, kids their age now are doing stuff that they're going to look at and be like, I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, of course, Stephanie, hopefully this has been helpful. Um, I know we're coming around to towards the end of the session. Um, how's everyone doing? Does anyone want to either show off all their awesome work? Does anyone have a bug they want to work through? Anyone have a question about something they would like to do in Desmos but aren't sure how to do? Please feel, please feel free to use this time um, however would be most useful for you. So yeah, if there's anything you'd like me to do, let me know. Um, otherwise, uh, okay, I just wanna say goodbye. I have an appointment, so I, I would love to come and uh, stay and pick your brain. Um, uh, so I too have your email now. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you and everyone, especially you for taking the time to do this and I certainly appreciate it. And i um, super glad I came to this. Thank you so much. Oh, of course. And real quick, Lori, before you go, if you wouldn't mind taking the exit survey, um, I've also opened that link in the, in the Desmos activity. Um, but yeah, if everyone could please, excuse me, if everyone, Oh goodness, it's lunchtime. I'm getting hungry. Uh, if everyone could please take that exit survey, that'd be great. Uh, Margarita, do you happen to have an introduction, uh, to Desmos activity? Um, <laughs> uh, yes, but it's probably tailored a bit more to me, uh, and, and my teaching. Um, so not potentially, but not really. <laughs> um, but I know there are a ton of introduction Desmos activities. Um, Desmos introduction new school year activity. And um, I'm sure Google is usually the better way to look at it. I guess they're, let's see, it looks like that's just a video. Maybe I put too much in. Um, here, let me put. Uh, that's introduction. Ooh, this looks cool. Desmos intro for students. Um, <laughs> I can tell already that I like this. Um, oh, look at, so these right here are pretty fun. You can have students modify the robot to, to so they can just share how they're doing today. Um, so yeah, uh, this might be a cool activity. I'll put this in the chat. 
um, that somebody made. Uh, you do want to Google things, though. They have a search bar here, but I don't know why. Their search results only filter in activities that Desmos themselves have made or activities uh, that they've taken on. Thank you, Leslie. Um, have a great rest of your day. I'm so glad you had a good time. Um, so I would Google search if you're looking for activities. Also, just a heads up, when you send like collections, if you want to be able to find the collection again, you have to click the little plus in the corner to make sure you add it to your own um, stuff so that you can find the collection again quickly. Thank you so much, Lisa. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, Stefan. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Anything I can help clarify? I have a question. If, yeah. when, as Lisa mentioned, we add the collection to our account, if we assign it to students, do you get to see any of their answers because you're the creator, or do we just get access to that? Whoever assigns it is the person who gets access. Okay. And so, yeah, so that was the issue Lori was talking about because she wasn't the one to assign the activities. So, um, you know, she didn't get to see the responses unless you add another person as a co-teacher. That makes sense. Thanks Ooh. so much for clarifying. Of course. Yes, this is a perfect time. Uh, so Margarita and Leticia, you had wanted to see the workaround. Um... Actually, let me find one first. And I'll be honest, I didn't use it because I don't, I didn't like it. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I don't know. My, my, oh, thank you, Guadalupe. Have a great day. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my, my team had different views on the idea of auto grading and whatnot. I I personally, and this is just a personal preference, I prefer to grade by looking at, at their work and, and, you know, doing it that way. But I also don't have kids. Um, <laughs> so that makes a bit of a difference. Um, so let me see if I can find one. Oh, I know where to go. Here we go. Okay. So when I said I do Desmos for, ev for everything, I literally mean I do Desmos for everything. Um, <laughs> and for the final, I got permission um, for my PLC to, what we did is we rewrote the final in Desmos so students could show their work, so we could confirm more, more or less that they weren't cheating. Um, but at the same time, they needed to be able to input their answers into student view. So what they did, what, what we did is we created a note here that showed the answer for each question. So right now it just says, please answer and submit number one, because in this preview, I haven't answered number one. Um, but when I go into the dashboard here and let's just take a look. So this person, I can see their answer for question number one is four comma 11. Their answer for number two is, and this was a multiple choice one. So that's why it's got kind of weird formatting and a few different sentences. Um, this is their answer for number three. Uh, four and five were graphs, so they had to sketch them. Uh, so it didn't actually uh, do anything here. Uh, question six was a select all. So you can see these are all the ones they selected. Um, questions eight, nine, and 10 were just simple number entries. So it just shows up with the numbers right here. And so is it auto graded? No, but it's a lot easier to grade if that's something you need. And the best part is that you still have students work readily accessible. So if you're like, wait, this student did this, you can just really quickly go back and see, oh, here's their work right here. Um, so yeah, 
Does that help show you what we did? So, okay. So it's, it's basically just a question that pulls their answers all together. Exactly. Okay. And would you want me to show you the coding for that? Sure. Yeah. Just to see how complicated it is. It gets a little complicated, but to be <laughs> fair, this final was a little complicated. The final made it needlessly complicated because it had a lot of select all and multiple choice. So um, it's much easier if it's just, here's a problem, type your answer. Here's a problem, type your answer. Um, are you, sorry, are you able to view like each student's response to a question simultaneously? Yes but not through that, that's a function that's inherent to Desmos. So for example, I could, uh, oh, well, I'm editing right now. Um, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so for example, if I go in here, I can, I can look and see, um, I can just scan through and see, okay, correct, wrong, correct, very wrong, very, very wrong, um, <laughs> correct, wrong. And, and so I can just kind of get an overall glance at how the class did. Um, and, and then how do you use that to actually grade? Like, do you have a separate um, like Excel document or how are you keeping track of, or do you do it on there? So um, the way I graded the final, um, I, what I did was I simply, um, I just looked at everything and I would just write down all the points they earned um, and then put that total into the grade book. So I didn't really use an intermediary except for my notebook. Um, that's, that's how I did it. Um, another so one by one. Say, uh, I did it one by one, but I, but, but again, like I said, for me, I really do want to see students work when I'm grading. Um, right. So I, I myself never used the slide 15 to grade, um, but I know other teachers did and what they would do is, so like, let's say they're grading this student's work. Okay. Um, again, this is a bad example because there's a lot of graphs they'd have to go back and check. Um, but what they could do is they could use the feedback section and they could just type in here, uh, you know, plus one, plus two, you know, and so on and so forth and use the feedback, um, as a way to keep a mental track with the final, we paused it and the students had no access to their work afterwards because it's the final. So, so the, the, the feedback isn't for them in this case, the feedback is just for the teacher to help mm -hmm. them grade. Um, I, the reason I was asking is because I was using uh, formative, go formative. I don't know if you've heard of it. No, I've never heard for of it. For assessment purposes this past year. Okay. And I just wondered if it, this did the same thing where yeah. I could see, like I could look at students work mm -hmm. per question. I could, grade that way, or I could grade individual. Yeah, so you could grade individually and this, so you could grade each question. So like, let's, I don't know, you know, maybe your grade book is set up so that each question is its own entry. You could, you could grade it. I would unanonymize it so you could look at every student, um, but you could grade it that way where you see every student's work and you can give them a grade this way or um, and this is what I would do. I would click right here. And so now I'm just looking at Shi Shen Chern. Um, uh, you know, that's their code name. Um, but I'm just looking at their work and I'm seeing, okay, um, this is everything they've done um, for that problem. And then I would, you know, on my notebook, write down plus whatever, go to the next slide. Okay, that that's done you know, that's done um, and grade it that way. Yeah, uh, my partner, my, my partner, I, I found with my middle schoolers, I couldn't really get them to read the feedback too much. Um, 
my partner used the feedback extensively uh, with her students, but she has 11th and 12th graders. So they were very responsive with the feedback. So she would, she would grade in here, you know, three, oh, bye Lisa. <laughs> she would grade in here three out of four points because and tell them and, and that's, that's how it worked for her. Um, so yeah. So yeah, does that help show you how you can use Desmos for grading? Awesome. And I just want to acknowledge this is the official end of the session. Please feel free to leave whenever you need to. I can stick around for at least another 15, 20 minutes. Thank you all so much for coming. Please do fill out the exit survey. I hope to see anyone again or some of you tomorrow um, for the self-assessments. Have a great rest of your day. I saw the TCA, you raised your hand. Maybe not. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, no worries. Um, and let's see. Is Desmos program with the names of math? Ah, that's a great question, Mark. Yes. So these, you do not have to add names. That would be very tedious. Um, these are the names of famous mathematicians and they just auto-generate it. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's yeah, of cool. course. Thank you so much, everyone. Any questions, anything you'd like me to go over? Any way I can support? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And Margarita, Juan, Steve, Scott, thank you so much for coming. If there are no questions, uh, then I think I'm going to go ahead and close the meet. And I hope each of you has a wonderful rest of your day. So if there are any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to close. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, Juan. Bye, Scott. Bye, Steve. Oh, do I have to stop recording first? Oh.